to the honored and distinguished shepherd of this flock, Dr. Cheryl Sanders, to the Reverend clergy, to my brothers and my sisters, and all of you who are a part of the family of faith. <clears throat> we greet you today in the name of the Lord Christ. It is a name that is above every name. And one day at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What a privilege, what a high honor you have given to me to be able to come and to share with the men of Third Church in this, their annual men's celebration. I'm grateful to them as well as extremely grateful to your pastor for her continuing friendship. And not only for her continuing friendship, but because of the magnificent contribution that she makes to the theological community of our nation and our world. She is indeed a gift to the body of Christ, and you should praise God for her. God be praised for the ministry of Third Church, for what you are doing and for what you are yet to do in the days and in the months and the years that are to come, even as you expand the tentacles of this ministry and find yourself in other communities or the widening of this community. We celebrate you and praise God for what God is doing in this place. I bring you greetings from the Metropolitan Church, now located in Largo, Maryland, and um, Pastor Maurice Watson is the new pastor there now. And they've let me go on to the pasture I used to be pastor, now I'm in the pasture. <laughs> and you have to understand the difference between those two assignments. But uh, I praise God for this continuing opportunity to preach even though I'm doing something quite different now than, than I used to. But it's good to be with you, to see many friends in this place. I want to thank the men's group for hosting me on yesterday and for sharing with me in a very a fruitful discussion, and then to see many of them in the choir today, and uh, that's, a, that's a blessing to me. Uh, and then as I got ready to preach, I saw they all left the pulpit. <laughs> that happened to me once before. I was, I was preaching in Australia for the Baptist World Alliance, and uh, when I went to the pulpit, there must have been a hundred people on that pulpit. But uh, what happened was that as they did, or as they performed their duty as a part of the worship service, one by one, they left the pulpit. And there I was standing before 10,000 people, and I was out there all by myself. I'm, I'm glad there are a couple of musicians who stayed. And that, that's at least a signature of grace, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. I... Uh, I wanted to tell you that I would not hold you long, I wouldn't keep you long. Of course, you know how, what good that is. That's, uh, that's about the same thing that Elizabeth Taylor told all her husbands. <laughs> I won't keep you long. <laughs> Let me call your attention to <clears throat> The book of Hebrews, a very short sentence, but one that is replete with power. It is in the 13th chapter of Hebrews, the 8th verse. If you have it, let's stand together. If you don't have it, let's stand together. Would you repeat after me? Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ the, same the same yesterday, today, today and, forever. and forever. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ the, same yesterday, the same yesterday, 
today and forever. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk on the theme, I nominate Jesus. I nominate Jesus. These are days when the lives we live are circumscribed and conditioned and controlled by the world we know as politics. And what I say has more than a simple ring of truth. It is the absolute truth. Politics is the thing that in large measure controls our lives, the water we drink, the food we eat, the air we breathe, the houses we live in, the cars we drive, and everything in between. Truly, our lives are confined and controlled by the world we know as politics. And I have not come here today to participate in political gamesmanship. I have not come today to soil this sacred pulpit with the noise of the political world in which we live. Nor have I come to stand in this place of prophetic preaching, all in the name of Jesus Christ, by smearing it with thoughts of either Republicans or Democrats. I've not come today to offer what may be on my part a strange portion of my own misbegotten ideologies or personal imaginations. Nor have I come with some strange brew of tea that has nothing whatsoever to do with the life lessons that are written in this book that we call the Bible. What we need today is to stand in agreement with one who needs no party, who sees outcomes that others cannot see, whose platform is always perfect, one who specializes in things that seem impossible, one who runs without opposition, and who by divine arrangement has healing in the hem of his garment, who speaks and does not stutter and does not stammer, and who has the power to do what no other power is able to do. I have chosen to stand on a righteous wall to remind those who would hear that politicians will deceive you, party platforms will exclude you, and if you are not careful, while you and I are in the process of preaching and praying, angry men on the day of your inauguration, vile men will cancel your vote, repaint the White House, and send your president home to Chicago where he came from. For that reason and for that reason alone, today I have come in spite of conventional wisdom to say to you, I nominate Jesus. Now then the question must be earnestly put. Why Jesus? Follow my thought. The world has known its great men. Call the role, if you please. Plato, classical Greek philosopher, mathematician, student of no lesser one than Socrates, a writer of philosophical dialogues and founder of the academy in Athens, the first institution of higher learning in the Western world. But Jesus was greater than that. Somebody finds Socrates, who, like Plato, was a classical Greek Athenian philosopher who was in his day credited as a founder of Western philosophy, but was always known to be an enigma. Even so, it was Socrates who suggested that the unexamined life is not worth living. But Jesus was greater than that. Have you seen Hannibal? Hannibal was regarded as one of the greatest military commanders in history. At the outbreak of the Second Punic War, Hannibal marched an army in the dead of winter, which included war elephants from Iberia, over the Pyrenees, 
and the Alps into northern Italy. They called him the greatest military strategist in human history. But Jesus was greater than that. Martin Luther set the church on fire when he tacked his 95 thesis on that church door at Wittenberg. And the Protestant Revolution he began signaled that the church would never be the same. But Jesus was greater than that. Sigmund Freud understood more than many the intricacies of the human mind. Winston Churchill was the statesman for his era. And while for the time Martin King Jr. sat confined to a Birmingham jail, he yet remained ill until he died a drum major for justice. But Jesus was greater than that. And they were all great men, but Jesus moved beyond greatness, beyond the finite categories of man's limited vocabulary and the insufficiencies, the pretensions of human knowledge. He moved beyond greatness, beyond the sphere of our limited and time-bound understanding of who we are and who God intended for us to be. Beyond greatness, beyond matters of color and culture, race and poverty, and all of the other conscriptions of our time. There are lessons still that we must learn. And Jesus taught those lessons. Jesus taught us how. He taught us how to hold an interracial conversation with that woman at the well, resident of Sychar, even though Jews and Samaritans had no dealings with each other. Jesus showed us how to get past religious snobbery when he taught, held that midnight meeting with a rabbi. That was the night when Jesus discounted the pain and the shame of the rabbi's life and then reduced it all to five little words, you must be born again. The disciples of Jesus thought that they had found the secret to greatness when they bothered to ask Jesus about seating assignments in the kingdom. And that was the day when Jesus responded, he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And so whatever your thoughts about greatness may be today, I want to tell you Jesus was greater than that. What Jesus started then was left in the hands of 12 frail fishermen who on their best night for fishing toiled all night and at morning light all they could say was, Master, we've toiled all night and found nothing. Jesus was greater than that. Cast your nets, said he, on the other side. I don't have time to tell you today that Jesus has something else in store for you. But first, you must cast your net on the other side. No matter how empty your nets might be, all Jesus wants from you is a willingness to cast your nets on the other side. What looks like failure over here may be victory over there. What looks like dismal over here may be sunshine over there. What looks like hunger over here may be a banquet over here. So here's the answer. Cast your nets on the other side. What Jesus started with, there's no room at the end. And then it escalated down to the sad reality of a borrowed barn. What Jesus started resulted in a story told by some frightened women standing outside of an empty tomb, and some breathless men running to see it for themselves. What Jesus started wound up on a blood-soaked hill called Calvary, and in an empty tomb he only borrowed for temporary use. Even when death was on his trail, and the grave was ready to put Jesus down to let him sleep for an eon or two. Here's the word I came to share with you. Jesus was greater than that. And for that reason, and for that reason alone, I've come today to declare to you that I, I nominate Jesus. I'm aware, of course, that I'm standing on treacherous ground at the intersection of that which is purely spiritual with that which is purely political. We do not wish to view Jesus as a political person. We, we do not wish to have a Jesus that gets tangled up in the political fray. Uh, we, we see Jesus and we want to keep Jesus as heavenly or out there, but not down to earth, down here. 
We understand Jesus as a spiritual deity, but not as a political entity. For us, there must always be a sense of separation between Jesus the preacher and Jesus the politician. And if perchance you do not see the politics in Jesus, I suggest you do not know the man. Everywhere he went, Jesus was confronted by the political realities of his day. There was so much growth in Palestine that it became necessary to have a recount so they could gather up the poll tax and so they could determine who could vote and who could not vote and who would count the vote and who would be denied the right to vote. Children, that's politics. They, they couldn't let everybody vote. And if you let everybody vote, you cannot be sure just who they would vote for and you would not be able to determine the outcome of the vote before the vote. Something wrong with that picture. Huh? But that's politics. You can't let everybody vote. Before you know it, these folk will be going to church on the Sabbath, and then they'll leave their hymn books in the seat and march themselves down to the local precinct there to cast their votes. I'm talking about souls to the polls. When they get through singing Amazing Grace, when they get through praying, Father, I stretch my hand to thee, uh, when they get through preaching and praying and testifying, somebody will tell you that you need to vote early and vote often. But somebody needs to say as well, get up off your knees and vote. Somebody may tell you that your vote will not count. Even especially now, after all of the mess this week. Don't believe it. Your vote will count. Get up off your knees and vote. You need to understand the nature of the enemy. The enemy is so bold as to believe that he is entitled to have what he wants. How he wants to have it. And all you are expected to do is to say thank you for whatever crumbs trickle down from his table. Do not forget, the enemy is a liar. So much a liar is he that he will lie to your face and never flinch. The enemy is not even trying to disguise what he's doing. The enemy is confident that he can manage the vote and disenfranchise you just because he is entitled to be in charge of being in charge. What the enemy does not know is that the same folk who went to the polls four years ago and four years before that are the same folk that need to be up and in the polls again. So get out and vote. I know this is strange preaching, but there's no other week in the year I can preach this sermon. Stop telling everybody else what to do and do something for yourself. Stop telling folk that you don't want to be involved. Look at yourself in the mirror, and the mirror will tell you that you're already involved. Stop closing your ears and shutting your eyes to the reality that is before you. There is a reason why folk are trying to minimize the vote. There is a reason that some persons in high places want to reverse the 1965 Voting Rights Act and then buy an election with a millionaire's cash. There is a reason that some folk are scared to death regarding who will take the vacant seats on the Supreme Court. But don't look now, but before it's all over, children, we're gonna need some more sit-ins. We're gonna need some more visits to the jailhouse. We're gonna need some more marches on Washington and Charlotte and Tulsa and Minnesota and, and Baton Rouge. We, we're gonna have to march in Ferguson for Michael Brown and march in Cleveland for Tamir Rice and march in Florida for Trayvon Martin because the battle is not over yet. The struggle continues. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against spiritual wickedness in high places. Oh, can I say what I wanna say? I don't want to offend anybody, but I believe I better say what I got to say. Come here, let me talk to you. There's one reason and one reason only why the persons who now seek to be elected are having such a struggle. 
There is only one reason why before his first day in office had come to an end, a congressional committee had already been formed to ensure the failure of Barack Obama's presidency. Only one reason why a congressman would have the nerve to call the President of the United States of America a liar to his face in the front of the entire world. There's only one reason why the Tea Party exists. There is only one thing that would cause America to elect a man of intelligence and dignity and articulate speech. But now, eight years later, appears to be on the verge of electing a racist bigot to take his place. Only one thing has this nation poised to replace a president of intelligence and compassion and common sense with a sexist, xenophobic, misogynistic buffoon who speaks before he thinks. Obviously because he does not know the difference between candor and idiocy and whose self-esteem is the centerpiece of his being. Am I in bad shape now? Can I preach a little while longer? Uh, one thing, and this is it, this nation is frightened to death because of the election of Barack Obama eight years ago and because of the rapidly shifting population numbers of this nation and the voting power of blacks and Hispanics and other non-white minorities, let me go ahead and say it. The white man is afraid that he will soon lose his control over the future of America. And that's why they want to take back America. Listen, you can only take back that which you think you have lost. That's why they want to make America great again. You got to understand again, I don't know what that is in grammar, but you got to you got to understand what it means to take America back again because America is obviously not great while a black man is in the White House. So I'm, I'm, I will say it. We would not have all of these problems. Terrorists knocking on our door, black men being shot down in the street by the police, trying to build walls to keep brown people out, putting up immigration barriers to keep Muslims out, were it not for something called pigment. The coloring substance of my skin. What sends the body politic into a frenzy is something called melanin. It's the thing that causes me to look the way I look. It's the thing that causes me to be unacceptable to the body politic. It's just something called melanin. I hear you saying it's more than that. I agree. I, I hear you saying it's more than that. I hear you saying we cannot always pin our problems on pigment or place blame on everything that there is on issues of race and culture. But I'll tell you this. I am much too old. I have come too far. I have seen too much to put my head in the sand and pretend that what I am seeing is not there. Here's what I know, children. If it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and wobbles like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. Somebody needs to hear me today. And you need to get off your knees and vote. Don't get me started in here today. Everywhere Jesus went, he was confronted by the political realities of his day. When Jesus told the Pharisees to render Unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. He dumped the money changers' tables over, and that, my friends, was a political statement. When Jesus told the scribes that he had not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law, my friends, that was a political statement. When Jesus said to those 5,000 folk who stopped to have lunch on a hillside, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That was a political statement. You need to trust me today. So, so whatever else you might say, the reality is that Jesus was a politician who understand, understood the political realities that surrounded him. And so you wonder, and rightfully so. 
why I place this name in nomination. My logic is clear. We need somebody. As messed up as this nation is, we need somebody with all the foolishness that I see on my television. We need somebody. America has become a nation of technological giants, but we are still controlled by moral midgets. America's economy is in the hands of crude politicians and corporate magnates of the world who think they own the earth in their prancing pretensions of stolen power. America's schools are in the hands of many who are unable to teach our children. We need somebody. We need somebody who will get in our schools and get guns and drugs out of the schools so we can get some truth in the schools. And we need somebody who can get in these refrigerators we call churches and transform them into the beloved community we were intended to be rather than to remain a society of the sanctimonious who take their Sunday seats on pews of pretension, singing songs that nobody wants to sing and preaching sermons nobody wants to hear. We need somebody who will get into our politics so that it will serve the people and not oppress the people. And that is why, Madam Chairman, I rise to place another name in nomination. I have another name to place on the ballot. The name I bring to the floor today is a name that is above every name. Yes. Our nation must return to a sense of moral integrity. We have lived the last decades through the tragedy of 9-11 and the rise of terrorism around the world. We are living in a time of institutional greed and legislative obstructionism. We are living in a time when every time we turn around, something else gets in the way and lies masquerade as the truth. But I have another candidate. My candidate is neither Republican nor Democrat. He is not libertarian nor is he green. He is neither conservative nor liberal. You, you don't have to worry if he's too rich for his own good or living beyond his means. In fact, my con candidate made a confession on his economics. I heard him say one day, the foxes have holes. And the birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. You don't have to worry if he will refuse to reveal his tax returns or choose to lay the burden of taxation on the shoulders of those who can least afford it. I heard him say for himself, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, Madam Chairman, today I nominate a man who is willing to do a clean sweep. It just seems to me, Madam Chairman, that if we're going to nominate someone, and if we're going to elect someone, it ought to be someone who's willing and able to clean house. In fact, my nominee is the candidate of change. Just the other day, I heard him preaching, if any man be in Christ, He's a new creature. All things have passed away, and all things have become new. Madam Chairman, you need to know something of my, my candidate's platform. You may not know this man, so you might want to just know what, his, uh, might, might, what might claim your vote when you step inside the voting booth. You must understand, Madam Chairman, that the first plank of his platform is a national program of food for the hungry. I wish somebody would talk back to me a little while. Listen, it makes no sense to live in a land that has the seed to sow, the soil in which to plant, the fertilizer by which to nourish, and water to facilitate growth, and still have 50% of the world's population that is starving to death. But I remember one day he was teaching on a hillside, and someone came to Jesus and said, Master, the people are hungry, and there's no 7-Eleven out here. Safeway is closed on Sunday. It costs too much to shop at Wegmans. There's no McDonald's and no Burger King. And we just don't know how to handle the hungry. But that's when a young boy stood up and this is what he said, I don't have much, but what I do have, you can have. And that very day, 5,000 souls were fed, not counting the women and the children. And they still had baskets with food running over. And that's why my candidate deserves this nomination. Now then, 
Madam Chairman, the second plank of his platform has to do with a national health plan. Whatever it is that enables us to earn the votes of our constituency must be undergirded and strengthened to ensure the health of our family and of our friends. The strength of our nation will be measured by the way in which we treat those who cannot heal themselves. My candidate, therefore, has a health plan. It's more than major medical, and it covers 100% of all your medical expenses. There will be no donut hole. There will be no vouchers. There will be no pre-existing conditions to prevent you from receiving the care that you need. This is how it works. There was a man who went down from Jericho and fell among thieves. He must have been wearing a hoodie, and he, 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 he must have had some Skittles and perhaps a little drink of some tea. But he fell among thieves. He fell among thieves, and they mugged him, and they left him for dead on the road. Somebody in here knows what it is when folk leave you for dead. Have a little trouble and the friends you thought you had will desert you and leave you on the road for dead. When your money runs out and you are down to your last dime, your best friend will leave you for dead. Ah, when your liquor has run out, your friends will run out and you'll be all by yourself and alone. And let me add a parenthetical note. The ones who left him for dead were church folk. The Levite was a choir member, and the priest was a preacher, but they both left him for dead. But something else happened. A representative from the Department of Health and Human Services came and filled out an application for public assistance for him, but he left that man because, you know, it takes two weeks for data to be processed. <laughs> and then another representative of Blue Cross Blue Shield came by, and told him that while he was out on the road, he let time slip by, and he failed to mail in his monthly premium, and his insurance had lapsed. And he couldn't help him anyway because he had a pre-existing condition. But after a while, a representative of old Jesus showed up. Did I tell you that a, a Jesus surrogate came by? Nobody asked a question. They just bound up his wounds, took care of him as best they could, took him to the hospital, and then paid his bill in advance. Not only that, I heard him say to the innkeeper, here's the money. Whatever else he needs, give it to him, and I'll pay you when I come back. Let me tell you, He's coming back. I said, I said, let me tell you, he's coming back. Not only that, my candidate has a permanent protection policy. For after you get out of the hospital and you need a little physical therapy to get back on your feet, he has a permanent policy. It says so right here in this book. He gives angels charge over you to bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And there's one more plank to my prom, um, nominee's platform. This plank, my brothers and my sisters, has to do with a matter called housing. Nobody's building. Banks are not loaning. Too many people have no roof over their head. Jerusalem was just a little city, and they had walls all around. So when the rich folk came in from the Judean hills, they wanted to put fo poor folk out and let the rich folk in. You're not listening to me. I, I, I said Jerusalem was just a little city, and they had walls all around it. So when the rich folk came in from the Judean hills, they wanted to put the poor folk out to let the rich folk in. It sort of goes like this. You never heard this before. It goes like this. Tax the poor and let them bear all the weight. But then give the rich a tax break because they are the ones who know how to generate all the jobs. Everybody, however, needed a place to stay. And many were without house or home. 
But I heard my candidate say, listen, you don't have to worry. For in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Uh, and I forgot to tell you that my nominee has a plan for national security. I know we're worried about cyber warfare and all of the rest, but, but I thought I'd tell you my candidate has a plan for national security. What is that plan? If this people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So I'll tell you what you do. Tell Homeland Security, I've got a plan for security. Yea, though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Tell the CIA that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Oh, boy, listen, I'm, I'm a realist. I'm a realist, and I, I, I realize there's a difference between allegory and fact. And I know that my candidate surely cannot win. He has no endorsements. This late date in the game, he has no PACs that can write big checks to underwrite his campaign. My nominee has no airplane, no private jet to take him from place to place. He is no fair-haired boy of local labor unions. He has no money coming in from big business. He can't give any speeches and make $150,000 for clearing his throat. He has no foreign bank accounts. His latest contributor to date was a little widow woman who threw in her last dime. He has no campaign posters up and down the street, no billboards to attract passersby, no flashing lights to gain their attention. In fact, the only sign he's got is so old it's about to fall down. Outside the city, near the garbage dump, there are these words you'll find on a little placard. It says this, if you want to know where you're going, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for the world of lost sinners were slain. And I realize there's danger in what I'm saying. I realize that in this day and age, there is no guarantee that even Jesus can win the nomination, let alone the election. But here's what I need you to know. If Jesus is not nominated, if Jesus is not elected, God is still God. God has keeping power. God has healing power. God can handle Donald Trump. God can handle Hillary Clinton. God can handle Bill, too. God has healing in his hands. God has all power in his hands and he can do what no other power is able to do. So my friends, Madam Chairman, I rise to place one name in nomination. May I share with you my candidate's name? He was born in a Bethlehem barn. His birth attended by shepherds and attended by wise men. And his name is Jesus. He earned his keep while a carpenter in his daddy's shop. He is the man who could debate with doctors and could outthink lawyers down at the synagogue. In fact, they have the reputation that he's a lawyer that has never lost a case. And his name is Jesus. He is the man that walked on water. He is the man who put his foot on the sea. He is the man who stirred up the waters down at Bethesda Pool. He is the man that went over to that wedding feast at Cana and turned water into wine. He is the man that pulled up buckets of living water from the well that he argued, while he argued with that woman from Samaria. He is the man who put new clothes on Legion. He is the man who brought Zacchaeus down from his tree. And that's why I nominate him 
And just in case you don't know his name, ask the writer of Hebrews. For the candidate that I talk about today is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I place his name in nomination. His name, they call him Mary's baby. They call him the matchless lamb of God. They call him the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. I place his name in nomination. His name is Wonderful Counselor. His name is Everlasting Father. His name is Prince of Peace. His name is Mighty God. I call him Jesus. They call him Light in dark places and my hope for tomorrow, my walking cane and my, 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 my leaning post. I place his name in nomination for there is no other name, no other name under the heavens where men might be saved other than the name of Jesus. Oh, I don't know. I don't know much about Obamacare. But I do know that Jesus cares. In fact, somebody raised the question one day, does Jesus care? When my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song, as the burdens press and cares distress, And the way grows weary and long. Oh yes. He cares. His heart is touched with my grief. And when days are weary and long nights weary. I know my Jesus cares. I do not know just who will win the election. But I know this. There's nobody like him. And I don't nominate Jesus because of what he's done for others. I nominate Jesus because of what he's done for me. I said, there's nobody just like him. Nobody can help me like him. Nobody can walk with me like him. Nobody can talk with me like him. Nobody can wipe my tears away like him. Nobody can heal my body and help me to run on like him. And nobody can hope me like him. Ah, let me tell you, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, on Christ, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground. 